Hi, good afternoon. This is Dr. Ina Rabon, and my task for today is to give a lecture on the updates in the management of endometriosis. So although this lecture should be just focusing on the updates uh, in the treatment of endometriosis, I think it is very important that we review some of the basic concepts of endometriosis, such as epidemiology, symptomatology, pathogenesis and diagnosis and in the last part of this lecture we'll go on to discussing the modern management of endometriosis so endometriosis is defined as the presence of functional endometrial tissue that's glands and stroma outside the endometrial cavity and this ectopic islands of endometrium are functional non-neoplastic and hormonally responsive and this condition was first described in 1860 by Von Rokitansky. So this is a benign disease, yet it has the characteristics of a malignancy. And why is that so? Because it is locally infiltrative, invasive, and widely disseminating. And the growth of ectopic endometrium is stimulated by physiologic levels of estrogen. So endometriotic lesions are mostly seen in dependent portions of female of the female pelvis and the ovaries are the most common site. Now from our books, we know that there are three cardinal histologic features of endometriosis and these are of course ectopic endometrial uh, glands, ectopic endometrial stroma and the third would be hemorrhage into the adjacent tissues. And these are the most common sites of endometriotic implants. Now, from literature, we gather that about there's about 10% of reproductive age uh, women that are affected by uh, endometriosis, and endometriosis has been also reported in up to 40% of adolescents with genital tract anomalies, up to 50% of women with infertility, and up to 70% of women and adolescents with pelvic pain. However, determining the prevalence of endometriosis in the general population is challenging because some women are actually asymptomatic and those with symptoms can have varied and non-specific presentations and definitive diagnosis is typically um, through surgery. So these are the risk factors for endometriosis that is listed in our uh, official textbook. No? So the risk factors include nulliparity, prolonged exposure to endogenous estrogen, shorter menstrual cycles, heavy menstrual bleeding, obstruction of menstrual blood outflow, exposure to the ethyl silvestrol in utero, height greater than 68 inches, lower body mass index, and high consumption of transunsaturated fat. So this uh, last three risk factors is very hard to explain the, the pathogenesis. No? Okay, so there are three phenotypes in endometriosis. Number one will be the superficial peritoneal lesions, and the color of the lesion varies widely and may be red, brown, black, powder burn, white, yellow, pink, clear, or red, or a red vesicle. And the predominant color depends on the blood supply and the amount of hemorrhage and fibrosis. And the color also appears related to the size of the lesion, the degree of edema, and the amount of inspissated material. The second phenotype would be OMA, that's a short term for endometrioma, and these are the ovarian cysts that we see in patients with endometriotic, endometriosis, that whose sizes we range from less than one centimeter to sometimes as big as 20 centimeters. And the last phenotype will be the deeply infiltrating endometriosis or the DIE, and these are uh, endometriotic lesions with penetrations of greater than 5 millimeters. And this uh, phenotype represents a more uh, progressive form of the disease, you know, a more severe form of the disease. So the typical profile of a patient with endometriosis is in her mid-30s, nulliparous, involuntarily infertile, and with symptoms of secondary dyspnea and pelvic pain. And these symptoms usually disrupt the social, professional, academic, and economic potential of our young women in living with severe cyclic or continuous pelvic pain or the threat of its return, often for decades, can also lead to anxiety and depression. So now let us discuss uh, some theories in the development of endometriosis. 
we all know this from our books, from official, from our official textbooks. So the theories of uh, retrograde menstruation, synomic metaphasia, lymphatic and vascular metastasis, iatrogenic dissemination, immunologic changes, and genetic predisposition. So, so we shall um, quickly discuss each. So the um, the most popular theory would be Samson's theory of retrograde menstruation. This is the reflux of menstrual blood and viable endometrial cells in the pelvis that leads to implantation of endometrial cells in the pelvic peritoneum and under the hormonal influence grow as homologous grafts. So what are the evidences or findings that support uh, the Samson's theory of retrograde menstruation? So most of the time, endometriotic lesions are discovered most frequently in areas immediately adjacent to the tubal ostia or in the dependent areas of the pelvis. And also, endometriotic lesions are frequently found in women with outflow obstruction of the genital tract. And this is a very nice diagram, which uh, shows us the proposed establishment of peritoneal endometriotic implants via the retrograde menstruation. So you see here, endometrial cells that are in the menstrual fluid that reach the peritoneal cavity. So immediately they are infiltrated or attacked by the immune cells or inflammatory cells so as our first line of defense against these uh, foreign bodies. So this attack or infiltration by the inflammatory and immune cells actually activates these endometriotic cells, leading to cell growth and angiogenesis. So this um, endometriotic implant secrete prostaglandins and also they produce estradiol because as we remember, these endometriotic lesions have their own aromatase system. And in, in the long run, this produces fibrosis, scarring, and pain. The second theory is the salomic metaphasia theory, which we also call the theory of embryonic malarian dress or malarianosis. This refers to the metaphasia of the salomic epithelium or proliferation of embryonic dress. So this theory actually purports that Cells residual from embryologic malarian duct migration maintain the capacity to develop into endometriotic lesions under the influence of estrogen beginning at puberty or perhaps in response to estrogen mimetics. And this theory finds support in uh, epidemiological studies reporting a twofold increased risk of endometriosis in women exposed to diethyl stilvestrol in utero. So examples of um, this uh, theory would be that endometriotic lesions we, has been discovered in prepubertal girls. Of course, these are girls who are not yet menstruating, and yet no, some surgeons have actually found endometriotic lesions in, in this age group. Also in women with congenital absence of the uterus, in men, but of course, these are very rare cases. And, residual reaction of isolated areas of peritoneum during pregnancy. The third uh, theory would be the lymphatic and vascular metastasis, and this helps to explain rare and remote sites of endometriosis such as the spine, the nose, pelvic lymph nodes, forearm, thigh, and even the lungs. And those patients who have um, endometriotic lesions in the lungs, usually they uh, experience monthly uh, hemothorax and this is what we call tatamenial hemothorax whereby uh, these patients have bloody pleural fluid that occur during their menstrual flow or their monthly flow the fourth theory will be iatrogenic dissemination and this is when endometrial glands and stroma are implanted during a surgical procedure such as um, in cases of csr endometriosis where you see endometriotic lesions usually in the subcutaneous layer and uh, episiotomy scar in the diffuses. Now, the most, um, is, shall we say, the theory that is most commonly cited by most experts is the theory of immunologic changes, whereby this theory states that there is altered function of immune-related cells that are directly related to the pathogenesis of endometriosis and that abnormali there's abnormalities in uh, cell-mediated and humoral components of the immune system in both the peripheral blood and peritoneal fluid. So let me show you a diagram of this, um, uh, of this slide. Okay, so 
So you can see here, you know, the primary immunologic change involves alteration in the function of the peritoneal macrophages that are prevalent in the peritoneal fluid of patients with endometriosis. So here in the upper panel, this is um, for women with no endometriosis. You see that they have the monocytic type of macrophages in their peritoneal fluid. And this uh, monocytic type of macrophages have a short lifespan and very limited function. However, in patients with endometriosis, you know, they have uh, more peritoneal uh, macrophages that are larger. And this large uh, peritoneal macrophages are actually hyperactive cells that secrete multiple growth factors and cytokines, and these chemicals enhance the development of endometriotic lesions. There's also the role of um, steroidal hormones or hormones in the, in the pathogenesis of endometriosis. So in this upper panel, this is panel A, this is um, what really happens though, in a normal endometrium or in the endometrium of a normal woman, meaning a woman with no endometriosis. So you can see here, normally there is a low activity of the enzyme COX-2 in the endometrium or uh, cyclooxygenase 2. And thus, there is low production of prostaglandin E2. You know? And also, uh, during the luteal phase, the progesterone-dependent 17-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase enzyme catalyzes the conversion of estradiol to estrone. And of course, now in the normal endometrium, there is no inherent aromatase system there, and therefore no added estradiol is being produced. And so uh, in a normal uh, woman with no endometriosis, there is uh, no excess production of estradiol in the endometrium, and there is low prostaglandin E2 locally. So what happens now in the endometrium of a patient with endometriosis? There is um, a slight increase in the production of cyclooxygenase 2 enzyme, leading to a moderate increase in the production of prostaglandin E2. Okay, so also in the endometrium of a patient with endometriosis, there is aromatase activity that um, produces estradiol and that leads now to moderate production of uh, prostaglandin E2 and a uh, slightly higher production of estradiol. So here in panel C, this explains now what happens in ectopic endometriotic tissues. So there is very high levels or very yeah, very high levels of a cyclooxygenase 2 enzyme and therefore high levels of or high production of prostaglandin E2. Of course, there is an inherent aromatase um, system in endometriotic uh, tissues and therefore that produces or leads to a high production of estradiol. And in endo ectopic endometriotic tissue, the enzyme Hydrox, uh, hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase is defective. Okay, so if it's defective, therefore it cannot convert estradiol to estrone. And now we are, or well, we have a production, a very high production of prostaglandin E2 coupled with a high production of estradiol locally. So autoimmunity may well uh, exist in women with endometriosis, and there are reports of increased. B and T cells and serum immunoglobulin, uh, IgG, IgA, and IgM autoantibodies in endometriosis. And so there are also reports that there is evidence of higher prevalence of other autoimmune diseases in patients with endometriosis. And the last theory will be uh, genetic predisposition. And this theory purports that there is familial predisposition to endometriosis with grouping of cases of endometriosis in mothers and their daughters. And the incidence of endometriosis in first degree relatives or women with severe endometriosis is thought to be around 7%. Now, having said all that theory, you know, I just want to say that endometriosis does not have a single unifying explanation that accounts entirely for the varied clinical manifestations of this of this disease. So no, there's actually no single theory you know, that can explain the pathogenesis of endometriosis. 
Now we move on to clinical diagnosis, just a quick review of how we diagnose endometriosis. Of course, we start with a good history and physical exam. And the classic symptoms, of course, are cyclic pelvic pain and infertility. And the cyclic pelvic pain is related to the sequential swelling and the extravasation of blood and menstrual debris into the surrounding tissues. And the chemical mediators, as we all know, are usually the prostaglandins and cytokines. And the extent of pelvic pain is often inversely related to the amount of endometriosis in the female pelvis. Dyspareunia is associated with endometriosis, that is associated with endometriosis, is described as pain deep in the pelvis. And the cause of the symptom seems to be the immobility of the pelvic organs during, a coit during coital activity or direct pressure on areas of endometriosis in the uterosacral ligaments or the cul-de-sac. So for physical exam, of course, a classic pelvic finding would be a fixed retroverted uterus with scarring and tenderness posterior to the uterus. The characteristic uh, tender nodularity of the uterosacral ligaments and cul-de-sac and the injuration of rectovaginal septum may be palpated also on rectovaginal exam. That's why it's very important that when you suspect a patient to have uh, endometriosis, it is important to do a rectovaginal exam. And the, when is the best time to do the pelvic exam? Of course, during the first or second day of the patient's special uh, flow, and this because this is the time of maximum swelling and tenderness in the areas of endometriosis. And diagnosis can be confirmed in most cases by direct laparoscopic visualization of endometriosis and also biopsy of these um, endometriotic implants or lesions. So how about imaging? Now, imaging can be a useful adjunct to the clinical presentation and physical exam for evaluation of endometriosis. And transvaginal ultrasound exam should be the first line uh, diagnostic imaging to be used because it has the highest sensitivity and specificity in identifying ovarian uh, endometriomas and it is also helpful in differentiating solid from cystic lesions and may help distinguish an endometrioma from other adnexal abnormalities and because the lesions of endometriosis are vascular increased doppler flow may be demonstrated in endometriosis now uh, just a disclaimer i'm not a sonologist so if you have questions about uh, what I've written in this slide, now maybe I can refer you to our friendly sonologist for a further explanation. So anyway, these are um, texts that are lifted from our official textbook. And it says that there are actually four ultrasonographic steps to the evaluation of the pelvis with suspected endometriosis. First one is the traditional evaluation of the uterus and the DEXA for adenomyosis or endometriomas. So adenomyosis is observed more frequently in women with deep endometriosis lesions compared with those with superficial lesions. Secondly, ultrasound probe is used to determine the location of specific tender spots that may reflect disease-specific sites to be investigated at the time of surgery. Third, uh, evaluate the cul-de-sac or the pouch of Douglas to determine whether there is deeply infiltrating disease or obliteration using the sliding sign. So in where pressure is placed on the cervix with a probe to see whether the anterior rectum moves freely across the area of the vagina next to the posterior cervix and upper uterus. And fourth, this evaluation for nodules of the anterior compartment, that's the bladder, and the posterior compartment. So the posterior compartment includes the uterus sacral ligaments, which are not seen by ultrasonography unless there is a nodule, the rectovaginal septum, vaginal wall, and the rectum. Now, diagnostic laparoscopy is undertaken to establish the diagnosis of endometriosis. And it is also very important that when we do diagnostic laparoscopy, we describe the extent of the lesion systematically. No? And we use the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. And then this is actually a point scoring system that is designed to record the extent of the disease, in, uh, especially for patients who are desirous of pregnancy. Okay? The focus here is uh, intended to provide characterization of the disease extent no, for fertility and not really for 
pain assessment, although we usually use this also for pain assessment. There is actually another a scoring system that we use, the EFI or the Endometriosis Fertility Index, which also focuses on the fertility potential of the patients with endometriosis. So just to give you um, an idea of the ESRM point scoring system is, so this is the ESRM staging, so where we stage it from stage one to stage four. So stage one will be minimal, two is mild, three moderate, and four severe. So we have, um, actually ASRM has provided a more detailed you know, um, uh, picture depicting the uh, stages of the disease so that it may serve as a guide for us to, you know, for, for all of the clinicians to use. There's also the engines Enzian staging, and this is the staging that we use for deeply infiltrating endometriosis. And lastly, the EFI staging, this is the endometriosis fertility index that we use uh, to predict the fertility of a patient with endometriosis. Now, before we move on to finally discussing the modern management of endometriosis, I would like to um, introduce the concept of endometriosis life. And this is a concept that was first introduced by Professor Chapron in 2019. In his article that I placed here, no, this the, the source is here. You might want to download it because it's a good, actually a good read, no. And um, Professor Chapron in this article says that endometriosis is a lifelong disease, the course of which we term as endometriosis life, no. So recently, the definition of endometriosis has evolved to one that is more patient focused and takes into account the cellular and molecular origins of the disease, its natural history from teenage years to the menopause, no? its complex, chronic and systemic nature, the variety of tissues involved, including the central nervous system, no? and the need for treatments that address the long-term suppression of ovulation and, of course, pain. So as I've already mentioned from the previous slide, no, the central nervous system plays a major role, an important role in the pathophysiology of uh, chronic pelvic pain in endometriosis. Now, aside from the inflammatory pain mediators that contribute to endometriosis-related pain, such as the cytokines, chemokines, nerve growth factors, uh, another theory that can explain the severe chronic pelvic pain in endometriosis is the theory of the central sensitization pathway. Okay, so this theory postulates that repetitive and persistent peripheral stimuli contribute to central sensitization in myofascial pain. Let me say that again. Repetitive and persistent peripheral stimuli contribute to central sensitization in myofascial pain. Now, the effect of central sensitization can explain the common coexisting uh, chronic syndromes characterized by pain, such as painful bladder syndrome, vulvodynia, myofascial pain, and irritable bowel syndrome. And furthermore, central sensitization, which can become autonomous and occur independently of the peripheral stimulus, is associated with changes in the regional gray matter volume within the central pain system and with altered brain chemistry. No, so structural and functional changes in the CNS neurons have tonic activation and may be hyper-responsive to even the mild stimuli. So just imagine no, all these severe chronic pelvic pain that our patients, or maybe some of us here are experiencing, are mainly due to a tonically activated central nervous system that is hyper-responsive to even the mildest stimuli. As such, pain symptoms should be treated without delay to avoid central sensitization, as this can become autonomous, occurring independently of the peripheral stimulus. Another theory 
that can explain uh, the chronic pelvic pain in endometriosis is the cross-organ sensitization phenomenon. And uh, this postulates that there is actually the spreading of noxious inputs from a desired visceral organ to a normal organ in, cross proximity, in close proximity. So this is um, the cross-organ sensitization is thought to be due to a shared uh, nerve pathway. And this is thought to occur when sensitized uh, afferents from one organ induce sensitization uh, of the afferents innervating another organ. And visceral afferents converge into similar, er similar areas of the spinal cord, providing opportunity for the sensitization of neighboring cells due to spatial location. However, the precise mechanism is or remains unclear. Now, for the last part of this lecture, we go on to discussing the modern management of endometriosis. So as I've already mentioned, endometriosis is a chronic inflammatory disease that requires lifelong management. I've already mentioned this, no? the concept of endometriosis life. As the endometrium is diseased in women with endometriosis, the patient is endometriotic for her entire life. And again, this is what we call the patient's endometriosis life. Now, for this key reason, ultimately, the therapeutic strategy needs to have a long-term perspective and not to be limited to immediate and systematic surgery after diagnosis. Let me say that again. Please do not limit your management to just immediate surgery you know, after diagnosing a patient with endometriosis. The challenge actually in the coming years will be how to best determine that perfect moment to perform surgery, which again no, should ideally have to be done once during the entire endometriosis life. Determination of the best time to perform surgery is one of the main indications for long-term medical treatment. So currently, unfortunately, there is no curative treatment for endometriosis and clinical management of symptoms such as pain is through medical or surgical measures or usually a combination of medical or and surgery uh, treatment. Medical management follows the basic principle, of course, of reducing inflammation, suppressing ovarian cycles, and inhibiting the effect of estrogen. And But usually, you know, these treatments only target symptoms and not the underlying mechanism of the disease. And this is a committee opinion that was published by the ASRM in the journal Fertility Sterility in 2014. And um, they say that this endometriosis should be viewed as a chronic disease that requires lifelong management plan with the goal of maximizing the use of medical treatment and avoiding repeated surgical procedures. So what, the, what actually are the current treatment that uh, is available for endometriosis? Of course, we all we have surgery, you know, medical treatment in the form of hormonal treatments or non-hormonal treatments. But usually, we give a combination of uh, surgery and uh, medical treatment. And the last uh, option also will be to perform um, ART or assisted reproductive technology. Now, modern management of endometriosis should be patient-focused rather than focused on endometriotic lesions. And Professor Chapron, in his article in 2019, also emphasized that medical treatment can be administered without histologic confirmation. Of course, no, we have to rule out first the, the other possible causes of pelvic pain no, before we institute medical treatment for endometriosis. Now, the two primary short-term goals in treating endometriosis are the relief of pain and promotion of fertility. And the primary long-term goal in the management of endometriosis is attempting to prevent progression or recurrence of the disease process. And medical treatment should be the first therapeutic option for patients with pelvic pain who have no immediate uh, desire for pregnancy. And the choice, of course, will depend on a favorable profile, depending on a safety, tolerability, and cost, of course. Multiple surgical procedures should be avoided whenever possible. And 
This is because surgery has inherent risk and might result in adhesions that can cause pelvic pain and decreased ovarian reserve. Women of reproductive age with endometriosis should be encouraged to pursue pregnancy at the earliest time possible, no? earliest time that life circumstances allow because there's you have to understand and you have to emphasize this to your patients this disease has the potential to threaten their fertility okay this is one of the advice that i usually give out for all my patients especially the young patients who have endometriosis okay treatment goes no pain relief complicate reduction of complications avoiding repeated surgeries and of course improving fertility now, the only indication sana for immediate surgery in endometriosis will be the following. No? Suspected borderline or malignant lesions, bowel, um, deeply infiltrating endometriosis that involves the bowel, especially if uh, there are already obstructive symptoms, and ureteral DIE with ureteral hydronephrosis. Uh, some experts in some literature would also recommend surgery for patients who are not any more respond are responsive to medical treatment. Of course, that means that you have already exhausted or all, med all possible medical treatment or, or all available medical treatment you know, before you say that the patient is not anymore responding to any of the medical treatments available. So just to emphasize now, in modern endometriosis management, the patient needs to be at the center of therapeutic decisions and damning options available. You know, but you have to involve your patient in choosing the best management, okay? So these are the medical options that we have, you know. So GnRH agonist, oral contraceptives, progestins, danazole, aromatase inhibitors, LNG ID, okay? selective progesterone receptor modulator, NSAIDs, no? All of these are available locally. Okay, so there are the newer therapies, the antiangiogenesis factors, TNF alpha blockers, peroxisome proliferator, activated receptor gamma ligands, or PPAR gamma. But these newer therapies, of course, are not yet available locally. Sorry, um, my fault, no. GnRH uh, antagonist is not yet available. The Elagolix is not yet available locally, but is already available abroad. No, so, but most of these, no, all the rest are available locally. So the choice depends again on uh, a favorable profile. Look at the safety, uh, the safety profile of these medications, availability, of course, no, tolerability and cost, no. It's very important that you ask the patient if she can afford these um, medications. So you always have to factor in the cost. Okay, so this is just a table showing to you the available medical therapies for endometriosis. And um, this is a very nice table because it gives you the dose of the drugs. No? So as you can see here, progestines, we can give um, the, the depot or even the oral form of uh, medroxyprogesterone acetate. We have the Yinogest. We have norethindrone acetate, no? LNG IUS, okay. And for GnRH agonists, we have luprolide, coserilin, nafarilin. Okay, we have we can also give danazole. Okay, Elagolix is uh, one of the newest drugs that is um, that is available uh, in abroad, no? not yet available here, but um, the manufacturer said that. May be available sometime next year here uh, in here in the Philippines. We can also use that result, newlypristal acetate. Okay, so this is a very nice diagram again from that article by Professor Chapron. Okay, so you can see here, uh, this is the algorithm for patients with for patients with endometriosis, and these are uh, for patients without an immediate desire for pregnancy. Okay, so patients with pelvic pain, as you can see here, no, the first line will be to offer that patient uh, COCs, progestines, or the Okay, 
Now, if the patients are not responding to the first line medications, you can uh, offer GnRH agonist. Now, if there's failure of medical treatment, then that's the time that we can offer surgery. Uh, then even after performing surgery, uh, we still offer post-operative medical treatment. Okay, so for patients with no pelvic pain, meaning they're asymptomatic, okay, but on ultrasound, there is OMA or endometriotic cyst. Of course, we offer fertility preservation. Even with pa on patients with pelvic pain, we offer fertility preservation. Okay, And then, again, we offer medical treatment. Okay. So these are the guidelines or the recommendations by the ESHRE. ESHRE is the European Society for Human Reproduction and Embryology. And these are the guidelines. So ESHRE recommends to offer women hormonal treatment you know, as first line, as one of the options to reduce endometriosis associated pain. Okay, what are these hormonal treatment? Combined hormone contraceptives, progestines, and gender H agonist or antagonist. Of course, gender H agonist and antagonist should be second line. No? And uh, the ESHRE also recommends that clinicians should take patient preferences, side effects, efficacy, costs, and availability into consideration when choosing the hormonal treatment for patients with endometriosis associated pain. The ESHRE also recommends to prescribe women with gender H agonists to reduce endometriosis associated pain, although evidence is limited regarding dosage or duration of treatment. And if you do um, administer gender H agonist as a second line uh, treatment, you have to explain to your patient the side effect profile. Okay. And of course, institute ad back therapy to prevent bone loss and hypoestrogenic symptoms. Okay, so that's it for my lecture. And in summary, no? endometriosis is a chronic inflammatory disease that requires lifelong management. Pain symptoms should be treated without delay to avoid central sensitization, as this can become autonomous, occurring independently of the peripheral stimulus and can explain coexisting chronic pain syndrome. And lastly, medical treatment should be the first therapeutic option for patients with pelvic pain who have no immediate desire for pregnancy. Thank you for your kind attention.